Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. Today we're going to continue our intermediate series. We're now amazingly on to episode 19 already. Never thought we'd get there, but the uh, any sort of doldrums we've gone through in winter where there might be a dearth of uh, species to, to do uh, has definitely gone. We have a backlog half a mile long of species we're trying to get through, including all the note taking that we have to make. I did want to touch on a side note. Obviously we get a lot of views, particularly on Facebook, I mean, the last few episodes have been in excess of 3,000 views. For those based in the UK who maybe didn't realise, uh, we are a shop that's open to the public. We are a reptile specialist based in Sheffield. And much of the stock that you see featured in these videos can be seen physically within the store itself. You'll be able to come down, seek any advice in real time. Both myself and Paul would be more than happy to help you with anything that you'd require regarding your reptiles. So today's episode... Uh, is about this absolutely breathtaking snake, one of mine and Paul's absolute favourite Indonesian pythons. This is the golden white lip, also known as the northern white lip, also known as the Dialbert's python or Dialbertis python. Latin name is Bothrachillus albertesi. First described as Liasis albertesi in 1878 by Wilhelm Peters and Giacomo Doria. Now, Wilhelm Peters was a German naturalist and explorer. This guy was a herpetological heavyweight of his time, as well as a legit Indiana Jones type guy. I mean, it's just crazy. He was, he was the archetypical badass, seriously. As well as being the curator of the Berlin Zoological Museum, he was an explorer and visited Mozambique and Angola and charted rivers of like the Zambezi and things in 1842. So imagine, this must have been pretty hairy, 1842, Angola, Mozambique, this guy was, was serious business. Peters almost single-handedly oversaw the growth of the herpetological collection to make it on a par with both France and London. Herpetology was Peter's main interest, and over the course of his career, he described an almost unfathomable 122 genera and 649 species. Most scientists are chuffed to bits if they manage to just hit one and have it described, particularly, you know, with, with the way things change with taxonomy. Imagine getting halfway to your seventh century of species. It's crazy. So Peter has been honoured multiple times and here are a few. So there's Amphysema petersi, Anolis petersi, Geophis petersi, Moreria petersi, Riama petrorum. I expect Harry Potter to pop out somewhere. And Trachet, oh God, this one's a difficult one. Trachelo, Trachelopichus petersi. Got there in the end, which is a plated lizard, I believe, of some form. And the honours do not end there. Wilhelm Peters was even honoured by having a bay in Greenland named after him. Giacomo Doria, or Giacomo Doria, was an in internet. <coughs> Giacomo Doria was an Italian naturalist, botanist, and herpetologist, and latterly a politician. Although we'll not hold that against him. He had such a cool life, and chief, chief amongst which must have been being the founder of the Museo Civico di Storia Naturale in Genoa. This was posthumously renamed the Natural History Museum of Giacomo Doria. So, as well as being an avid entomologist, it is his herpetological exploits that we are interested in. Such was his influence that eight species were given to his honour. Agamadorii, Tias Dorii, Gonocephalus Dorii, Homolophus Dorii, Latacia Dorii, Skinkella Dorii, Stenodactylus Dorii, and Tropidinophis Dorii. He was also honoured in other groups of animals, having animals such as kangaroos, goshawks, frogs, scorpions, and even slugs named in his honour. Okay, so maybe he didn't end up with a bay named after him the way that Peters did. He would just have to settle for the main tributary river to the Jubba River being named after him instead. It's a hard life. Both these guys were OGs of taxonomy um, and just 
legit badasses where places are named after them, species are named after them, six and a half centuries of animals, like crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, just to have been around when these dudes were doing this stuff must have been amazing. So after the original description of Liasis Albertizi, as we've become used to in these videos, there is a bit of taxonomic tomfoolery. So to tell you about the changes, Leopython gracilis by Hubrecht in 1879, Liasis albertizi again by Boulanger in 1893, Liasis fuscus albertizi by Stull in 1935, Liasis fuscus albertizi by Capocasia in 1961, and Liasis fuscus albertizi by Stimson in 1969. So, a side note, Liasis fuscus is the brown water python from Indonesia and Australia and visually looks relatively similar to this, although with a less well-defined head and a slightly stockier body, but the iridescence and stuff remains the same. So, then it went to Bothrachillus albertizi by Cogger Cameron and Cogger in 1983. Okay, so this is the first time we've seen the use of the current taxonomic name. Bothrachillus was first described in 1843 by Fitzinger to describe the Bismarck ringed python or Bothrachillus boa, which incidentally had already had about a thousand stupid names up to this point. And I categorically state now, I hope we never get one in stock because I don't want to have to my, go through the minefield of Latin names that that place had and make any sort of sense out of the decisions that were made at the time. Bloody taxonomists. Le Lisa Lea Albertisi by Wells and Wellington in 1984. Morelia Albertisi by Underwood and Stimson in 1990. Okay, so WTF. I'm not an expert in this sort of stuff, but Morelia is the carpet pythons, the diamond pythons, and the green tree pythons. And they put this in with them, which visually could not be any more different. Uh, so, yeah, I'd... I'd they bear as much resemblance to a Morelia as I do to Ryan Reynolds. So I'm not quite sure what the thought, thought process was there. Leopython Albertizi by Cluj in 1993. Leopython uh, Albertizi by O'Shea in 1996. So this is how I knew them growing up as a monotopic species, Leopython Albertizi. And they were there by themselves. And Bothra Chillis boa was another monotopic species with just the one listed. Um... Then they went to Bothrachillus albertizi by Reynolds in 2014. The madness does in fact continue, but at this point, I have seen my ass. I've had enough. That's where it's staying. I'm not doing any more because I'd need another three pages. So who was this Albert dude? Right, the honour bestowed in the common name is for Italian naturalist Luigi Maria di Albertis, who was famous for his work in New Guinea. Golden di Albertis pythons are found throughout New Guinea, Irian Jaya and the Bismarck Archipelago. They are found on Salawati, Biak, Normanby, Musau and Emirau Islands. The tight locality for the species is given as Boreali Occidentali New Guinea, which essentially means Northwest. So, um, Boreali, Australi, so we'll know them as Borealis and Australis. And then East is Orientalist, West is Occidentalis. So there you go, the more you know. So, uh, there's three type localities given in the text that I read. There's Kapoor, Andai, and the Onin Peninsula. So the nearest major modern centre that I could find on Irian Jaya would be Fak Fak, which uh, roughly translates as a cockney dropping hammer on his toe. Uh, weather data for the region is sketchy at best, and as a result, we had to use the weather data that we used last week with the Papuan olive python Apodora papuana, and that is for the Manakwari Rendai region of the Birdhead Peninsula, which is 298 kilometers away. Hot season, October to December, 32 degrees. Cool season, the rest of the year, January to September, 31 degrees. So we're talking about a differential of one Celsius. Nighttime low remains linear throughout the year, 24 Celsius. Dry season, if you can call it that, July to October, 79 millimetres to 120 millimetres. Wet season, January to April, 154 millimetres to 191 millimetres. Temperature and humidity are pretty much linear throughout the year, so then for the purposes of reproduction, we involve barometric pressure, as discussed in the Papan Olive Python video, uh, and standardised uh, cycling would be used to be able to uh, get these animals to reproduce. <coughs> so, 
we would use the, um, the, 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 the barometric pressure of spiking humidity as a trigger point to hopefully get animals in the correct condition to breed and reproduce readily. Violet pythons can be more problematic as youngsters than adults. And as with many of the Indonesian pythons, they're susceptible to respiratory infections from being kept too dry. And whilst they don't necessarily want to be waterlogged by any means, ready access to a saturated damp box is essential to keep their skin in good nick. The skin is thin and prone to tears if allowed to dry too much. White lips are famed for the colour and the way that their smooth scales refract light and split it into its component colours. Freshly shed animals can look like they've been dipped in 30 weight oil. It is a sight to behold and a nightmare in photos to capture. And to be honest, a lot of times they just appear dull brown. But when you see one in the flesh and you see the light bouncing off them, there's something else completely. It's crazy. The head is gloss black and the labial scales, upper and lower labials, are striped straight with white and the lower rear labials are recessed with heat receptive pits to aid with nocturnal hunting. The, the bl gloss black head gives way to varying levels of yellow, orange, tan and gold, hence the name golden white lip python uh, and this tends to increase with age and it can lift slightly particularly once fed. This is only a moderately sized python and females will reach between six and seven feet. Males generally top out at between four and a half and five and a half feet in length. They can make up for it with their temperament and they can be incredibly defensive. And certainly within the varium, both of the animals that we currently have, a male and a female, will bite the holy hell out of you as you retrieve them from their enclosure. But once they're out, as you can see, they become reasonably, quite, quite docile. There's no real aggression or striking or anything like that and this is an imported animal so you would expect it to be on it but uh, as long as we start stay calm don't give it a uh, pause to become scared or alarmed we should be fine um so i found that the southern uh white lip which is uh bothrachillus meridionalis which is the larger black white lip that is um on the whole i found to be a tamer snake far less inclined to bite and whip the snakes are listed as terrestrial in habit, but they will climb. But I don't necessarily think that we need to offer them some sort of specialised boreal enclosure. They will use a low and long tank. Maybe if you give them some branches, they may have a climb and a bit of an adventure on them. But they're not going to live up them like some of the carpets or the green trees would. Um, also, uh, we want to make sure that we keep a moss box present throughout their lifespan. A lot of the Bothrachilla species really do like to be able to get into a damp substrate and this also helps them to shed their skin but when they come out of that they must be able to dry off a water bowl that they can soak in occasionally as well is useful but make sure that you seal the uvivarium well otherwise you're going to blow the wood once it comes out and it actually jumps in its water bowl and half the water jumps out so think about that and plan it out first uh, a 5x2x2 five by two by two vivarium would be fine for an adult female. We would use a ceramic heat emitter coupled to a reliable thermostat um, and, and that would be fine. A lot There's a movement in the hobby towards all snakes receiving UVB, at which point if you wish to do so you could provide that using one of the shade dweller options from Arcadia which emits a UV index of 1, so just low level UV. It will also help with the reflective tendency of the skin and really help them to pop inside the tank. Substrate of choice would be orchid bark uh, for the UK or cypress mulch for the US. And for, for the breeding purposes, standardised cycling. So this would be, when we talk about standardised cycling in our videos, we use uh, the reproductive husbandry of pythons and boas, Ross and Marzek. They provided graphs where they had standardised boid cycling, which is a slightly hotter, shorter day and a longer, cooler night coupled with a spike in humidity and an introduction halfway between this six to eight week period. And that's usually how we would get them going. And the, the Albertus pythons would follow suit with this. Uh, a dozen or so eggs will be laid. Uh, we would artificially incubate them in a medium of vermiculite to water, four parts vermiculite to one part water. Uh, and these eggs would hatch after about 65 days incubated at 32 degrees Celsius. If you want to know how to incubate eggs, visit our uh, snakes and adders advice videos and you will find in the incubator video uh, where we just use a rudimentary poly box but it works a treat and we've hatched everything up to black headed pythons in them with no issue whatsoever um, 
Another little idiosyncrasy of this species, which I find really cool, is when they eat uh, particularly furry prey, maybe some of the larger sizes of mice or rats, they will actually regurgitate fur pellets. So people oftentimes think that they've got some sort of gut problem, and they haven't. It is a trait unique to the D'Albertis python. So you will often find fur pellets scattered around your vivarium, kind of like a cat hocking up a fur ball. And I think that's just super cool. Honestly, as far as Indo-Pythons go, they, these, these animals are spectacular. They are... Um, incredibly beautiful but understated at the same time and a lot of that is how you're going to show them off and as they grow in size and they gain condition and gain mass and we keep their skin in good nick it's really hard to tell you just how pretty these snakes are they are phenomenal but they are also secretive and they may hide away a fair bit so if it's an ornamental display species you're after this might not be the species of choice simply fantastic make sure you do your research babies can be sensitive this is actually a yearling so they're born very much similar to corn snakes maybe slightly bigger maybe the size of an american rat snake baby so at which point they are really really small and they you know they can be very very sensitive we're now out of the danger stage with animals at this size and they should grow on with no problem and these promptly started feeding on defrost prey with no scent in whatsoever so you should be fine uh, stay in very tight control of your temperatures and make sure that you keep your moss box damp so that they've got the opportunity to get into a saturated, fully humid environment. And hopefully you should have no problems. Do not be disturbed if you find fur balls. And I think that's about it. We'll be back next week with another video on this extra long list that we've got. Remember, we're a shop. If you want to come and see us, you're more than welcome to do so. If you want to see on the website what stock we currently have in, visit www.snakesandadders.co.uk and you'll be able to have a look and a, a, a peruse at what we've currently got. To be honest, at the moment, our livestock list is off the chain, so I would definitely have a look. We'll see you all again soon. From me, Chaz, and Paul at Snakes and Adders, peace. Do you want a close-up? You are pretty on you, eh?